everybody, how are you doing? I'm Tan, this is Garrison and April. This band and I, we're so excited that you're here this morning. Would you stand and greet someone? It's so good to see you all. And sing with us.
Well, amen, Buckhead. We believe that God is here. We believe that he's working uh, in all of our lives. Whether you came in feeling that or not this morning. So let's proclaim his faithfulness to you. Here we go. I've seen my fair share of ups and downs. I've walked some hard miles on shaky ground. But from the place that I am standing now, and it's clear to see that you were right there with me. And all you ever been, all you ever will be, all you ever are is faithful, faithful. At least a million times I've seen it with my own. How 
Would you pray with me? Father, it's 
it's really good for our hearts to sing those truths this morning. God, every single person in this room, every single person watching online right now, we were made, we were designed to worship, to give praise to someone or something. And so Lord, this morning, it's, it's good for us to praise the one who created us. And God, oftentimes it, it doesn't feel like we have much to bring. It feels like sometimes all we can bring is, is a hallelujah. But Lord, what's so amazing to me is that you don't need us to bring anything more than that. That's all you truly ask for is just us. You just want what we have to bring. You don't need more. So Lord, may that be good news for someone in the room today that, that they don't have to do more. They don't have to, to, to bring anything different than what they can bring to you today. It's enough. They are enough for you and you are enough for them. And God, may that encourage our souls this morning. We love you, Lord. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray this morning. Amen. Amen. You can take a seat. Thank you for worshiping with us, band, crew. Thanks for leading us so strong this morning. Um, if we've never gotten the opportunity to meet, my name is Matt Noblet, and I get to be our college pastor and oversee our next-gen ministry environments here at Buckhead. And I really am so grateful for this church. I'm so grateful for this community, and I'm reminded of that every single week. But recently, a few weeks ago, we had this event uh, at our church called Launch, and many of you might have been here for that and that night. It was a powerful night together where we gathered with people who serve and invest in our church. And there was this video that was played at Launch, and it caught me off guard, I'll be honest with you. I uh, hadn't seen the video before the night, and it really did catch me off guard in the best way possible because it reminded me exactly why I'm so grateful for this church. So we thought, man, our whole community here at Buckhead needs to see this video, needs to hear this story. So if you would, turn your attention to the screens. Check this out. My name is Tom, and I guess it was about 15 years ago during a volunteer Sunday, I asked myself, what if I began serving? I was pretty hesitant and then finally decided maybe I could serve in a special needs room even though I really didn't have any particular skill set for that, but, you know, God just kept tugging at my heart. I finally signed up, went into that class, and uh, never looked back. So a while back, my wife asked me, she said, what if we served together here at Buckhead as we were transitioning down in a special needs room? And I thought, well, that would be fantastic because then we could do it together. And I really had missed my kids and the joy they brought me every week for many years. Then the pandemic hit, and as you know, I was really slow to open back up. Parents were hesitant to step back into the world. I get that. But we started asking ourselves, what if the kids don't show up? But then the class slowly began filling up, and we started making bonds with new kids. And we really enjoy seeing the facial expressions on the parents, knowing their kids are going to be safe and well-loved while they're attending church. So a couple weeks back, a new girl walked in. She was non-participatory, she was non-verbal, she was really hesitant and, and clearly skeptical. And we were thinking, what if she never speaks? What if we can't break through to her? The really cool thing about Upstreet is we want all children to understand the love of their Heavenly Father, and we reinforce that through Scripture. So a recent verse was the perfect verse for our new friend, is it so accurately addressed her anxieties, and we really hoped it would capture her heart and help calm her spirit, but how would we know? What if we never know? So one Sunday, she picked up a jar of Play-Doh, opened it up, and started playing with it, but it wasn't randomly playing with it. She was beginning to methodically write out the very verse we'd been studying, letter by letter by letter. She was taking her time, and it was going slow, but we were thinking, what if this takes all day? It wouldn't have mattered, because my wife and I said we weren't going anywhere. We'd stay till sunset if we had to. Then I asked her if she wanted to read it out to me, thinking she probably wasn't gonna do that. But you know what? God does give us all a voice, right? She began to read it out loud to us, and we just kept going, asked her if she understood how much Jesus really loved her, and she smiled this huge smile and said, yes, I do. We were high-fiving, it was just very celebratory, and we were thinking, what if we hadn't shown up today? Can you imagine missing out on this incredible blessing? 
We truly serve a what if God who uses everything to draw his children to him, even a 50 cent jar of play -Doh. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. Come on, how good is that? I love that line that Tom said, what if we hadn't shown up today? It's people like Tom and Kathy Rhodes who continue to show up, say, Lord, I want you to work in me, but I also, God, I'm making myself available. I'm, I'm positioning myself in such a way where, God, you can work through me to a moment like that where, where this student, this young child, ends up writing out something with Plato like that. That's a picture at the end there that you saw of what actually that moment led to. So amazing. And so there's some people in our church, we have a lot of new people coming every single Sunday, like so many first time people showing up. Maybe today, that's, it's your first experience. And I just wanna let you know that the best way for you to really get connected in our church and to make this big, big community feel a little bit more personal and the best way to, for you to get involved in the life and mission of this church is by taking a step in serving and allowing God to work in and through you. And so the best way we know to do that and for you to kind of get a sneak peek of all that God's doing here is, is actually at an event that we have uh, once a month called Volunteer Sneak Peek. It's the last Sunday of every single month that happens at the 9 and 11 a.m. service, and it's coming up. You can find out more about Volunteer Sneak Peek, uh, the upcoming uh, event uh, on the hub, buckheadchurch.org forward slash the hub, or scan the QR code on your seat, and it'll take you there, and you can find out all about it. And I can strongly encourage many of you would you consider taking that step and investing just like Tom and Kathy Rose? You never know what's on the other side of your yes and willingness to get invested. Um, hey, today we are kicking off a brand new series with our lead pastor, Joel Thomas, and it's a powerful, powerful topic. We're talking about how to monitor and check the condition of your heart. So I can't wait to dive in to check your heart part one in just a moment. Before we get there, turn your attention to the screens. Well, about nine years ago uh, this month, and the reason I know it was nine years ago this month is because our youngest child uh, is turning uh, nine this week. And as we were preparing to have our fourth child, uh, my wife and I were re-looking at our life insurance and decided we were gonna up our life insurance policy. Anybody ever do this? I don't know if you've done this before, but you add additional kids, you up the life insurance policy. It's interesting, we didn't up her life insurance policy, we just upped my life insurance policy. So I'm not sure what that's about, but um, we, I I had to go, as you know, you, you go and you have a, a, a routine physical to get to get your life insurance policy so that the insurance company uh, can figure out. And, and the insurance company came back to me and said, hey, did you know you have high cholesterol? And I was like, I did not know that I have high cholesterol. They're like, yeah, well, this is, this is um, something that's a little concerning. We need you to have, to do, you're gonna have to do some more testing, you know, before we can approve your, your insurance policy. So I went to a doctor, we had a trusted doctor friend and, and he said, okay, here's what we'll do. Um, we'll just go get an EKG, I'll look it over, I'll send the information, you'll be good to go with the insurance company. So he sent me to get an electrocardiogram, which um, wasn't that big a deal. They put some electrodes on you, they look at, at your heart and, and uh, quick and easy, in and out. So I get the phone call from the doctor and he said, hey, um, you know, it's not super concerning, but I noticed something on your EKG and, and it was enough irregular that I wanna do a, another test, just, just to be sure. This is just for precaution. I just want you to know I'm not alarmed. So he sent me to get an echocardiogram. Uh, which is uh, more used like sonogram technology. They look at your heart and, and um, 
And so when, when they did that test, it was sort of inconclusive and he wasn't satisfied. So he decided to order a nuclear stress test. At this point, I was like, okay, hold on a second. Am I dying? Like what's going on here? And uh, if you ever had one of these, like they inter inject radioactive dye into your, to your bloodstream and then they monitor your heart and then you get on a treadmill. Has anybody done this? Anybody with, okay, so a few of you have done this. A few of us offenders of the heart, I guess. So, so I get on this treadmill and the treadmill goes faster and faster and faster and it gets steeper and steeper and they're just like, you need to go as far as you can and go as long as you can. And the doctor did not know that my, one of my top strengths is competition. And I thought, well, what's the record? Cause that's what I'm going for. <laughs> and so I went as hard as I could. And, and at one point I had the thought of, um, if I'm not dying from heart disease, I'm gonna die from this stress test. <laughs> and so I went and went and, and, and turns out I passed cause there was nothing major and, and it was just primarily genetic. And they put me on some, some cholesterol medicine, medicine, but you, you, some of you have, have, have taken these tests. Some of you've had more extensive tests. You've had angiograms, MRI, CT scans. All of these things are designed to evaluate and monitor the physical, physical condition of our heart. And the, and the advancement in medicine is amazing. Um, and, and the goal of the test, by the way, is to surface and address uh, any issues um, that might be there so that you don't experience more serious problems, which is, which is why they do the test. But here's my question. And this is the question I want to deal with for the next couple of weeks. What about the emotional or spiritual condition of your heart? I mean, we have all sorts of, of sophisticated tests that tell us the physical condition of our heart. But what are the sort of tests? What are the things that you do to monitor on a regular basis the emotional or spiritual health of your heart? And, and some of you guys, I, I know you're going to push back and be like, this seems soft and squishy. And are we really going to talk about our feelings for the next several weeks? But this is really important. In fact, it's so important that Solomon, the wisest man, uh, the, the scriptures tell us the wisest man who ever lived. This is what he said. He said, above all else, <clears throat> in, in priority, when it comes to you and your life, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from your heart. Your, your, your translation might say, for the heart is the wellspring of life. The, the, the original Hebrew language has this, this idea that there's a source or this spring that, that flows out of your heart. And, and what, what comes out of your heart spills over into your thoughts and your beliefs and your words and your actions. And if you're not careful, it can impact your relational professional and personal life downstream. The, the, this stream, this spring flows into a stream. And if the stream is toxic and the, the stream gets contaminated, everything downstream gets affected by that. Because in the scriptures, heart, when it comes to your heart, we're not just talking about your feelings. Uh, your heart is functionally the command center of your life. It's the command center of your soul. This is the idea of the inner man or the inner woman. This is who you really are. It's at the core of what everything else in your life emanates from. The idea of your heart, it's inclusive of your mind and of your will and of your, your feelings and your emotions. And, and psychologists, by the way, they talk a lot about this. And specifically, you know, when we talk about heart issues in the scriptures, and that's what we're gonna talk about for the next couple of weeks. When, when we talk about heart issues in psychology, they use different terminology related to this. In, in psychology, and some of you who are psychology pre professors, I'm gonna significantly overgeneralize this, but, but the, the, the the, the idea is that you're experiencing some internal dissonance. There's internal dissonance on the inside of you and this internal dissonance, it, it creates issues for you in your life. It, it, it causes things um, to be affected in your life and, and under ordinary conditions, people that are experiencing internal dissonance with, without, um, without anything extraordinary or, or acute or severe happening in their life. Um, it, they have a hard time expressing themselves clearly. They can be avoidant or defensive or dismissive or, or live in denial. Um, they react to life uh, sort of, uh, you know, out, out of insecurity or to, to things that happen. And, and, and oftentimes they overreact. In fact, internal dissonance has been proven to hinder effective communication. It causes us um, barriers in, in understanding and empathy and openness. And ultimately what it does is it impedes our, our personal growth. It, it impedes productivity for people in life, and it makes re relational connection uh, really, really difficult when you have these heart issues, this internal distance. So here's the point. This is really important. 
This, is, this monitoring the condition of your heart is significant. That's why King Solomon said, above all else, guard your heart. So here's what I want to do for the next few weeks. I want to talk about things we can do, some specific, three specific indicators, reliable indicators for monitoring or guarding the health of your heart. That's what we're going to talk about one each of the next three weeks. So here's where I want to begin. Does anybody remember uh, this cute little rhyme? If you do, I want you to finish it with me. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but, but words will never hurt me. Words will never hurt me. This, this likely began with some well-meaning person consoling a victim of bullying or something like that. And it sounded good. Like the first time you heard it, it's like, oh yeah, I want that to be true. And we, we wanted it to be true. But isn't it true that most of us can think back on words that hurt us? Words that wounded you? Words that maybe even broke something on the inside of you or broke something in your soul? Maybe from somebody you looked up to? One of your parents, a coach, a boss, maybe somebody who was a hero to you, somebody who really mattered to you? Maybe it was your spouse or your ex-spouse, a trusted friend or an ex-friend, maybe your kids? I mean, you, somebody said something to you and it impacted you in an extraordinary way. And what most of us have come to realize through our life experiences is, is that this cute little rhyme is really a cute little lie. And the truth is, the truth is, is sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can really hurt you. They have hurt you. They can continue to hurt you and they can hurt other people around you. And while it's not always the intention our words can have a significant impact even when, when we don't realize it, even when we don't realize the weight of our words. When I was young, um, I was a lot, by the way. Um, my youngest is a lot like me, and, and I, I love him. It's, you know when you have one of those kids that are, that are like a lot like you when you, were, when you grew up, and it's like he's one of, those, one of those little guys that I love him so much, and he kills me at the same time. And, um, and my mom is so grateful that I have him because... Um, <laughs> It's paying me back for all the things that I did to her. So, so growing up, I was a lot. And I, you know, if, if the proper order of things is uh, ready, aim, fire, I was fire, ready, aim. Like I was even firing before I was ready. And on one specific occasion, um, I made a mess. Like I made a huge mess that was significant that um, I was not going to be able to clean up my own. It was something my parents were going to have to step in and clean up. And I remember when it happened, we were all together as a family. And I remember when it happened, my dad, he blurted out. He looked right at me, blurred out. He's, Joel, you're so impulsive. You're so impulsive. And there was this pregnant, quiet pause. And then the whole family burst into laughter. And, 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 I, and I remember in the moment, it was sort of like we glazed over it, like it was this really funny thing, but something got lodged in my, my heart. In fact, it continued to be a, a running family joke for a long time. And, and nobody, I don't think anybody meant it maliciously and, and, and it would come back up and, and I never spoke about how it really bothered me on the inside. And then I remember in my late 20s in, in leadership, I remember being paralyzed and I could not figure out why I had such a difficult time making decisions. And I was talking with a coach, like a, 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 a leadership coach. And uh, she and I were talking about uh, some of the things and experiences we had that, that paralyzed us from in, in leadership. And I remembered this story. And I remember telling her the story. And, and, and I remember that this was something that caused me to, to question my own intuition. I'm a feeler and, and I lead intuitively. And so often um, I, I was paralyzed in terms of my leadership, in terms of, of thinking, you know, what if I'm just being impulsive? And, and I had a difficult tr time trusting myself. I mean, words can be powerful. Some of you, you have your own stories. You have your own examples. You, you, you have some things that you call back from time to time that affect you or paralyze you or continue to hurt you. The scripture uh, um, in, in Proverbs talks a lot about our words. Not just that we should guard our hearts, but um, the, the, when it comes to our words, it says that words can be sword thrusts or they can be healing. And words can, can turn away wrath or they can stir up anger. Words have the power of life and they have the power of death. So here's my question. What makes the difference when it comes to the nature of our words? And what does that have to do with the health or the condition of our heart. 
Well, Jesus addresses this brilliantly in, in an awkward encounter. And it's like one of the most unlikely of places uh, for him to give this lesson. But if you have a Bible, Matthew chapter 15, I say this a lot. I probably don't say it enough. If you don't have a Bible or the, the YouVersion app is amazing. It's the Bible app. If you don't have a Bible or, um, and you want one, a physical Bible, we have Bibles. I would love for you to have your own Bible. If you can't afford one, you can go to the guest services table. Um, Matthew chapter 15, in the first few verses of the chapter, um, there's a, a a bit of backstory. The, the Pharisees are confronting Jesus, which never goes well for them. Uh, but apparently he and the, his disciples were violating one of the cleanliness laws, which the Jewish people took these very seriously. These were, these were the laws about uh, how to stay clean. It was about being obedient to God and staying in right relationship with him. And Jesus actually calls out the Pharisees for their hypocrisy and a misapplication of the law. And specifically, they were dishonoring their family. You can go look at those, those set of verses if you want. But this is sort of the background. So in the midst of them sort of misapplying this, Jesus has this mic drop moment with them where he kind of shuts them up as they're, they're kind of trying to call him out on, on, uh, on these cleanliness laws. And then he decides this is a teachable moment. And so Jesus, then he calls the crowd to come and to hear. And so it was just the disciples and the Pharisees, but he calls the crowds in. There's lots of people who've been following him because he'd been doing miracles. So he calls the whole crowd and he says, listen, and try to understand this. This is different from what you've been taught before. This is new. And he says this, it's, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. I know you've been taught this before. You've been taught that when you, when you eat things or, or you eat unclean animals or you eat unclean food or you haven't washed your hands or the right ceremony didn't happen, you know, that, that this is what defiles you. But you're actually defiled by the words that come out of your mouth, not the things that you put into your mouth. And then a couple of disciples push back on Jesus a little bit. It's like, hey, that's, a, that's, that's offensive to the Pharisees and it is new. It's different from what we've been taught. And they, they push back a little bit and then Peter stepped up and Peter said to Jesus, okay, hold on a second. Before we get into arguing about this, explain to us this parable. Explain to us the parable that says people aren't defiled by what they eat. And Jesus responds and he's like, don't you understand and he's specifically talking to Peter. Don't you understand yet what I'm talking about? Peter, you've been following me. You've been with me. You don't understand yet. So Jesus decides, and I think this is hilarious. He decides he's gonna break it down in the most simple of terms. And he gives them a biology lesson, really anatomy and physiology lesson. And he, he says this, he says, anything you eat passes through the stomach and then it goes into the sewer. Are we tracking? Does anybody need more details on, on this process and how it works? I know we're in big church, but we could give more details if we need to. Apparently they didn't need more details. So Jesus goes on, he says, but, but the words you speak come out of the heart and that's what defiles you. For from the heart comes evil thoughts. From the heart comes murder and adultery, all sexual morality, theft, lying and slander. And what's interesting about that to me is none of those are thoughts. All of them are actions, but they all originate with thoughts. They actually come out of the heart, which is where our, our thoughts and our will emanate from. And all of these things are damaging to you and they're damaging to people around you. They have a relational and personal impact in your life. He goes on, he says, these, these are what defile you. These are the types of things that ruin your life. These are the types of things that when they come out of your heart, downstream, destructive things happen. Brokenness happens. Difficulty happens in life. Eating, eating with unwashed hands, that will never defile you, which this is what the Pharisees taught. They taught that not washing your hands before you eat defiled people. It made them unclean and unacceptable, even detestable to God, which was a misapplication of the law. This isn't why God gave them the law of hand washing in the beginning. It, it, they, it, it, was, it was completely opposite of this. God gave them a different law. What, one of the things that's interesting about this is, is the CDC. Do you remember this during the pan, pandemic? Um, during COVID, um, the CDC came out and made this declaration. The most important thing you can do to mitigate the risk of spreading or being affected by the COVID-19 COVID virus uh, was to wash your hands. And then they proceeded 
to um, make sure and distribute. This was the most distributed uh, medical health information, uh, most widely distributed in, in the U.S., was how to wash our hands. We all had to relearn how to wash our hands. And here's, here were the steps. You remember seeing these? I think this is hilarious, by the way. We all, we had to relearn. You wet your hands first. You can't just lather them first. You wet your hands first. Then you lather your hands. Then you scrub your hands because you can't just lather. You 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 need to scrub. And your Apple Watch will actually, there's a setting that'll tell you how long you need to go to actually wash your hands. And then you rinse your hands. And then you dry your hands. And then, ta-da, you have clean hands. And, And now as adults, we all relearned how to wash our hands. But Here's what's interesting about this. And, and look, if you're new to Christianity or you're new to the Bible, I just want you to consider this for a minute. Did you know that 3,000 years before we discovered how de- d- diseases were spread, that they were spread through germs, which wasn't until like the late 1800s, 3,000 years before that, God instructed the Israelites to wash their hands to keep them from sickness. I mean, that's unbelievable, I mean, we didn't know that washing your hands was that important for staying healthy. But God, to protect his people, he gave him this instruction. And, and this is what's happening. The, the Pharisees are misapplying this. They're saying, no, no, this is how you have to stay right to God. And Jesus goes, look, no, there, there's something far more damaging than ingesting something that impacts your physical health. I mean, that can impact your health. But the, tor- the sort of internal dissonance that you let come out of you, the internal dissonance that comes from heart issues on the inside. It can be damaging to other people. And that's what can defile you. Jesus told another a parable to explain why this is the case. And this is what he said. He said, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Parenthetical idea, by the way, uh, in ninth grade, this is earth science. We've moved from anatomy and physiology to earth science. My ninth grade, I can't make this up, but I have to tell you because I'm a preacher. Ninth grade earth science teacher, his name was Mr. Roundtree. He was 6'5", long arms, and he didn't like Mr., so he just had everybody call him Tree. Perfect for earth science. So, so no, no good tree uh, bears bad fruit. No bad tree bears good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit, which we go, of course, apple trees bear apples. P- uh, peach trees bear peaches. People don't pick figs, figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. Okay, Jesus, that sounds awesome. What's your point? Here's his point. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. So you can actually store one of two things in your heart. You can store good things and you can store evil things. And whether you accumulated the good things or you accumulated the bad things or whether somebody handed to you or because of somebody else's words or because of somebody else's behavior, you were given or you were handed good things or bad things. There's two different types of things that you can store in your heart. And this is a big deal because the mouth, Jesus said, the mouth from from the mouth, uh, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What's in your heart is what eventually comes out of your mouth. Maybe not initially, but eventually, and this is, this is the law of integrity. Most of us, when we think about integrity, we think about moral integrity. It's like, hey, my, I need to do what I say and say what I do, that, that, that idea. But the, the law of integrity is just about congruence. It's not necessarily positive or negative. It's just what's on the inside comes on the outside. The law of congruence is like a banana. When you peel a banana, you expect banana-like, smushy, yellow banana to be on the inside. And when you peel an orange, you expect, you know, gushy orange to be on the inside. That's the law of congruency. What God creates has integrity. And the point is that what comes out of you is an indicator of what's stored inside of you. The things that come out of your mouth, the things that come out of your life are an indicator of what's stored on the inside of you. So when you store harmful and toxic things on the inside of you, They leak out, again, whether they're things you accumulated, whether they're things you're intentionally holding on to or not. When they get lodged in your heart, they get stored in your heart, they're on the inside of you, they have a way of coming out. Now, to to illustrate this, and this is a a sort of a a new drawing for me, so um, bear with me for a second. I know some of you like my drawings, some of you don't, but I have the microphone, I'm up front, so I'll do whatever I wanna do. So, (laughs) sorry, that was so real. So this is you. 
And you're a sphere. I know it doesn't really look like a sphere. It's hard to draw 3D. I'm going to work on that in a second. But this is you. And, and I'm actually going to draw the shadow side of you. There, there's a better side of you. If you could see this side of you, it's actually better than, than this side of you. But this is the shadow side of you. And, and some of you, you have the capacity. Actually, you all have the capacity. But some of you, um, you have hurtful things that come out of your mouth sometime. And I know we don't know each other well enough, so I'm not judging you. I'm just saying this is all of us. I'm pointing a finger at me too. We have the ability, but some of you, regularly hurtful things come out of your mouth and others of you, critical things. You have a, a, a really unique ability to be critical of other people. And, and some of us, we have the tendency for deceitful things to come out of our mouth. And, and the reason this is important is because this is what people experience on the outside. So this is, this is where we're going to try to go 3D. We'll see if we can, we can do this well. But if, if I were to cut a, a cross section out of you, and, and we were to look on the inside of you, and, and we were to cut back the layers, because you're complicated, by the way. I don't know if you know that. Um, just look at somebody next to you you came with. They'll tell you that you're complicated. Um, but you're complicated, and there's all sorts of layers to you. And, and on the inside of you, um, there's these layers that, let me see if I can make this a little better. There's, there's layers that, that, um, that are beneath the things that you say in your life. And, and you know this is true. And, and the fact is, is most of you are like an M&M. You're kind of got this hard candy coated shell and, it, and it's, it's sort of thin. And, um, and every once in a while, People penetrate through it and, and they see on the inside. But, but there's things on the inside of you that result in these, these, these hurtful and critical and deceitful words. Like oftentimes, and, and some of you, if you're, if you're a psychologist or a counselor, you know this, and, and it's a bit of an oversimplification, but hurtful things often come from anger or sadness that's stored in your heart that there's an anger or a sadness inside of you that's just beneath the surface and just beneath the layer. And that's the reason when you, when you sort of get provoked, that's the reason hurtful things come out of your mouth. And sometimes that comes from loss. It, it comes from you being hurt. It's the old cliche of hurt people hurt people. And, and that's what happens. There's, there's some type of loss or hurt that happened in your life. And, and maybe you're, you're presenting as angry about it, but anger is just the, the non-vulnerable version of sadness. When you're vulnerable, you're willing to be sad, but when you're, when you're not wanting to be vulnerable, you're, you're angry. And, and oftentimes, hurtful things come out of your, your mouth when, when you're talking to other people. And it's not even really about the situation. The, the, the situation sort of provoked it, but it just came out. And sometimes you're not even sure where it came from, but, but you, act, you, 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 um, you act or you overreact or you say things and people are like, wow, what, what got into them? You, you've seen this happen with people. And, and critical people are critical words. Um, they oftentimes come from envy uh, or jealousy. We, we're, we're jealous of certain other people. And, and that envy or jealousy has a root as well. There, in some ways, we're discontent with, with our own lives. And, and there's a discontentment that gets lodged in our heart. And it leads to envy and jealousy of what other people have and what other people get to do. And that causes us to be critical of other people out of our own insecurity. And then, and then there's deceitful words. And oftentimes, this comes from shame. We're deceitful or we're dishonest because we have shame or guilt about the truth about us or, or where we really are in life and we want to make it seem like it's better than it is or we've done things that we want to cover up and we don't want other people to know about it because we have a fear. We have a fear of being found out. And, and these are just a few examples. This isn't all there is, but, but there's a lot more going on than just the words that come out of your mouth. I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but um, I've seen this in all sorts of different places. In fact, just the other night, I was at a high school football game. It was a playoff game. And I'm listening to a whole bunch of parents and people yell things at players and at coaches. And if you're not from the South, by the way, you probably have a hard time understanding this, but we're passionate about our football. And I'm hearing them say things about players on our team and players on the other team and coaches on our team and coaches on the other team. And, and you're just listening to people and you're like, I wanted to turn around at one point and go, do you hear yourself when you talk? Like, I, I, and, I, and I stole this line. It's one of my favorite lines from a, a movie called Jurassic World, Chris Pratt. I, I love Chris Pratt. But in the movie, there's this guy going off about something insane about using raptors to fight a war. And, and he's like, do you hear yourself when you talk? 
And I don't know if you've ever experienced somebody before when, when they're talking, you're like, I, I don't think you actually hear the words that are coming out of your mouth. You're not experiencing yourself the way people around you are experiencing you. There's clearly something else going on there. And the point is this, we can monitor the condition of our heart by monitoring the nature of our words. That was Jesus's point. What comes out of you is an indicator of what's stored inside of you. And when hurtful and critical and deceitful and dishonoring things come out of you, you should get curious. You need to wonder. The, the question is, what are you storing in your heart? Because those words aren't just a, a matter of the situation that you're in. They're not just a, a, a set of cognitive logical thoughts. Oftentimes, they're connected to things that are happening deeper on the inside of you, and they're emanating from your command center. So what's beneath or behind those words? What, what's the root of where they're coming from? I had a, a counselor that when, um, and, and I probably had a thicker candy shell than, than the most people. And, and she would often pick at me all the time, like trying to get me to, to talk about more meaningful things. Cause I would just talk about the things that are happening and this is what's going on around me. And, and, you know, she asked counselor questions like, well, how does that make you feel? And all those sort of things, what used to bother me. And then finally she provoked me enough to where I, I would have this like really honest response and really tell her what I was thinking about a situation or about somebody else or about her in some cases. And I would just blurt it out and she'd be like, like she just, all she would say, she'd get, she'd, she'd get real calm and she'd just say, hmm, that sounds important. And I was like, what are you talking, what do you mean? What, what sounds important? What, what sounds important about it? She'd just say, I don't know, that sounds important. You should think about that. And I'm like, you're the counselor. Why don't you tell me what it means? Like, like that's, why, that's why I'm paying you. That's why I'm here. So, but this is her way of trying to get me to, to discover the thing beneath the thing. And we all want to live up here on the surface because it's hard work beneath the surface. It's hard work to dig into those things. And, and, and we want to push back. And most of us push back. Oh, it's squishy. And I don't want to talk about my feelings. And it's soft. But it's not soft. It's challenging. It's hard work. And it's almost never about the thing that's on the surface. It's almost never about what you're talking to your counselor about. It's almost never about the words that you spoke. It's all, almost never about the thing that you were reacting to because our destructive words are often linked to something deeper going on inside of us. We're dealing with anger or bitterness or jealousy or insecurity or guilt or shame, and we don't even realize it because it's not on the surface. And it's been a while since we've dug below the surface you ever watch somebody lose their mind over something pretty insignificant? And you thought, this is not about that. I just was uh, in Australia uh, visiting some of our partner churches, which is amazing, by the way. God's doing some incredible things over in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, we're getting ready to get on a plane to come home, 15-hour flight on the way home. And we're getting ready to get on the plane. And this lady loses her mind uh, on her husband, starts berating him and yelling at him over the order in which they're getting onto the plane. Like it was, and I, I was watching this and I was like, this is clearly not about that. There's a lot more going on there than, than you know, the, the fact that he walked in front of her to get on the plane, which is sort of what provoked all of this stuff. And she's losing her mind. And, and, and I first, my first thought was, I wonder what's going on. There's probably a lot more going on. I thought, this is exactly what I'm going to talk about on Sunday. Maybe I should talk to them and find out what's going on. And then I thought, I do not want to talk to them for the next 15 hours about this. And God bless him because he's going to sit next to her the whole way on the flight. Anyway, that's another story. But, but I just thought, you know, you've seen this before and you thought, this is not about that. The truth is, is for her and for many people in those circumstances, maybe for you. She's holding on to something that really has a hold of her. And most of us are storing or holding on to something in our heart, and it really has a hold of us. And, and we have to get curious. I mean, what are you storing in your heart? Your words are an indicator of this internal dissonance that's happening inside of you from what you're storing inside your heart. And, and this internal dissonance, it, it, it needs to be dealt with. In fact, psychologists, by the way, um, I love this. 
Um, I love it when modern psychology or modern science, whether it's hard sciences or the soft sciences, prove things that the scriptures already told us. But psychologists commonly address internal dissonance uh, with, with a therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy. You may have heard that term before. If you haven't, don't worry about it. Feel free to go look it up if you're interested. But it originated around the 1960s. Like it didn't exist before that. So this is a, a, a way of, of getting at internal dissonance and dealing with it. And one of the key steps in the process is something called cognitive restructuring. Cognitive restructuring. Now that sounds like really official and, uh, and sort of a complicated process. And, and it is in terms of leading somebody through it, but it, it just in, involves identifying and challenging certain negative or irrational thoughts uh, that, are, that are in your mind and replacing them with more realistic or positive or in most cases, more true thoughts. Amazingly, whether we knew it or not, before the 1960s, we already knew this. In fact, this is a very, very old idea. It's a very biblical idea. In fact, Romans chapter two, uh, chapter 12, verse two says this. Look at this. And some of you know this verse. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So, so when, when the apostle Paul describes the transformation process, how we become free of or change and, and we, we become free of the things that are, that are lodged inside of our heart that we need to be transformed from or at least, at least restored from. This is what he says. He says, you have to be transformed and you have to let God transform you into a new person by the renewing of your mind. So here's what this looks like. And for those of you who want to get curious and you're gonna start to pay attention to your words. Here, here's the first step. The first step is to hear yourself. And, and I, know, I know this sounds strange, but you gotta listen to your words. You have to really pay attention, um, especially to the negative words that come out of your mouth. And, and the reason is because um, when you begin to hear yourself and hear the things that you're saying, what happens is, is is you begin to get clues as to something that might be going on in your heart. You at least find a doorway towards your inner self, towards the command center. And if you, you have a hard time doing this, you need, some of you need to empower somebody else. Who is it in your life that you've empowered? Probably shouldn't do this with your spouse. Probably shouldn't do this with your kids or your parents. Who's a trusted friend? Who's somebody in your life that you could say, hey, listen, I need you to help me pay attention to my words. Somebody you're around more often. And, and I want you to point out when I say things that are hurtful or things that are critical or th things that seem dishonest or deceitful, I want, you to, I want you to point out to me and I want you to help me pay attention to my words. And then, and then after you, you listen to yourself, you hear yourself, the, the, the next step in the process is to look inside and, and to pay attention and go, hey, what, what, what could this be connected to? What could this be connected to inside of me? If hearing yourself is about your words, looking inside is about paying attention to your feelings. What are the things inside of you that are connected to you? What are the emotions that are connected to the words that came out of your mouth? There are many different types of emotions. There's something called a feelings wheel that'll help you figure out exactly what the emotions are. But discovering what these emotions are that are connected to the words that you're speaking. And you have to look inside. What are the hurts or hangups you're harboring or storing inside of you? And then the, the third step, and the reason I write this in the passive is because this is what the scripture says. The third step, is to be restored. And the thing I love about it is, is in, this, in this word, in this word restoration, we have um, the idea of storing things. And, and this is about your thoughts. The way we're restored is by renewing our thoughts, renewing our mind, which is another translation of this scripture to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It, it's the idea that there are certain thoughts that have led to feelings and those feelings have led to words and behaviors. And the way you change the way you feel and change the words and the behaviors in your life, it begins with changing the way you think. So here's my question. How might God want to transform your heart to restore your heart 
by storing new things in your heart, truer things in your heart, more wholesome, more right things in your heart. This is the idea of cognitive structuring, restructuring that, that counselors and psychologists, clinical psychologists use all around the world, secular world and, and religious world. It doesn't matter. This is one of the most common practices is co cognitive behavioral therapy. Here's the thing. The scriptures have been saying this for a long time and God wants to participate with you in the process. How might God want to transform your heart and ultimately your life? by changing your perspective on the people and experiences responsible for what got lodged in your heart. Now, this is important. This is not easy work. This, we push back at this, especially guys. We think, oh, that's, that you just need to buckle up. You need to be more disciplined. And, and how's that working for you, by the way? It doesn't work so well because there's something in the command center of your soul that actually dictates what you do and what you say. I recently heard somebody say this, that heart work is hard work. This is why we push back on it, because it's difficult. Don't miss this. You owe it to yourself. You owe it to your future self. You owe it to those closest to you to figure this out. You owe it to your family. You owe it to your spouse. You owe it to your team. You owe it to your future because the heart's the wellspring of life. Solomon says, above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. So maybe the most important thing you can do is discover what you're storing in your heart because what you're storing inside of you will eventually flow outside of you and it'll impact your life. I told you I had got lodged in my heart this idea that I was impulsive and in my 20s, what that looked like oftentimes was um, me being um, critical and uh, me being dismissive of other people, me being a little sarcastic and passive aggressive. I had this thing lodged in my heart and um, some of you know this is part of my story. Um, my dad died when I was 17. And there was no chance to take it back or make up for it or apologize. I don't even think I knew when he passed away that it was a big deal in my life. Until later it resurfaced and I was carrying it with me and realized this is something I need to deal with. And then, like only God does, in my late 20s, as I was wrestling with some of this and talking with a a coach slash psychologist that was helping me in the midst of this. I got married not long after that and I was celebrating a milestone birth birthday, my 30th birthday. My wife, she got me the most extraordinary present. She couldn't have known, I never told her that story. My dad was my hero, it was hard for me to ever speak negatively about him. In fact, the truth is I would, I would tell you that the 17 years I spent with my dad, I'll take over having a, any other type of dad. But that one thing was lodged in my heart because I held him in such high esteem and I didn't know what to do about it. And my 30th birthday, my wife got me this present. And to you, it looks like six golf balls. Um, but on top of the fact that I got six dozen Pro V1s, because in order to customize these, you have to, get, you have to get a whole dozen of them, which was an amazing present in and of itself, because they're not cheap golf balls, and so that was awesome. I don't have any of them anymore except for these six, but um, they're all in the woods somewhere on some golf course. But um, I got these six golf balls, and on them, she had printed a single word from the people that had had the most influence in my life as to how they saw me. And um, it was three of my mentors, Bill Willits, who's one of the six people that started our church, and he married Jen and I, who's a mentor of mine, great friend. Andy, our, our senior pastor, Louis Giglio, had a significant impact on my life for a number of years. We did ministry together. Um, my uncle David was my dad's brother. My brother, who's my best friend, and a, another pastor friend of mine that 
we traveled together through seminary and this sat on my shelf in my office for a lot of years. And it was one of the things God used to renew my mind, to help me to see myself with what was true about me and of who I really was. And the truth is, is this is what God can do for you. There's something inside of you that you're storing, that you're harboring, that you're holding on to. And what you're storing inside of you will eventually flow outside of you. And if you're not careful, it has the potential not only to defile you, but it has the potential to devastate someone else around you. So what are you storing in your heart? The way you'll find out, the gateway, the door to figure it out is to pay attention to your words. It's a test. If you want to check your heart, pay attention to your words. It'll help you to understand what you're storing in your heart. Then the transformation process can begin. Let me pray for you. God, I pray for somebody who's here today and they felt that internal dissonance inside of them for a while now. And they're not sure what was wrong. They see it seep out from time to time and they try to, they try to close their eyes to it. They don't want to pay attention to it. But for whatever reason, you have them here this morning or they're listening to this, or they're watching online and you're pointing out for them, you're stirring inside of them that there's an internal dissonance. There's something they're storing in their heart that needs to be extracted and needs to be replaced. It needs to be restored. I pray you'd give them clarity as to what specifically that thing is. I pray that you would bring trusted people around them that could help them discover the truth. And then I, I pray that you would make it crystal clear to them as to how you want to restore, what you want to replace that with. As they look inside, I pray that you would help them to be restored so that what comes out of them, what comes downstream, so that the wellspring of life that's inside of them would lead to true and everlasting life in this life and the life to come. God, I pray that you protect from misunderstanding or judgment today and that you give people the soberness of mind to just simply reflect on what's going on in their heart because everything flows from it. Help us today to have the courage to do it. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The coming weeks, we're going to continue our series. Before you go, I just want to remind you, uh, we'd love for you to check out the volunteer sneak peek in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'd love to have you participate in one of our teams. Um, so I uh, hope you'll consider joining us for that if you're not currently on a team. Other than that, we will be back next week with part two. Have a great week. Let's go be the church where we live, work, and play, and we'll see you next Sunday.